Okay, the mic's picking me up, right? You can hear me in the back. I, now, don't count this as part of my talk. I'm just going to say something to Harish. You know, catechesis. See, I often give uh, lectures in Bengali. And on such an occasion, I, uh, I, uh, I made a translation of catechesis, which was otikai. And I said that I'm only going to use it for this sentence and then forget it. So there is also such a thing as translating and then removing the translation. But it will not die because, what do you know, Orindam Chakrabarti has picked it up as something to think about. So I just wanted to mention that the catechesis thing does not end with Harish's having to find out what the concept means. Now I begin and let me look at the time. There isn't a... Not yet. I mean, I will show, so if you want to put it down now. Yes, let, let it come down. I, I'll only call for three or four slides, and I'll tell Shumika, you can turn your chairs. Okay. Um, I am, in fact, deeply honored to be here. As Harish was saying, this is my first visit, but as Harish was saying, this is not a place that one can ignore in the history of intellectual production and resistance and establishment and res resistance again in um, India. And also more than India. And I'm also happy because I was a little bit envious that my very, very dear friend and ally, Edward W. Said, was invited here long before I ever set foot here, which is today. And I told Edward so. I said, Edward, you get everywhere, man. And this is in India. They have not ever invited me. So and I said, well, darling, was Edward's answer. Anyway, I, I, therefore, I really do want to say that it was, it's, it's a genuine honor to be standing here addressing you. And thank you for turning out in such numbers. My title, Harish, is actually, What is it to translate? What is it to translate? I want to open with the position implicit in the assumption that it is possible to translate. I want to open with the right to an original. Whenever we speak of a right, we are speaking of something like constitutions. The idea of rights is conceptual. The human being is much larger than concepts. That is why the fact of an original language is simply a fact for anyone who can give and take in a language. Human beings learn the language or a mixture of languages in their parents' arms or their caregivers' arms or under extreme politics, sometimes even in displaced persons' camps. Whatever that may be, no human being can be separated from an ability to make meaning associated with the time before reason had begun. When, on the other hand, we consider things from the perspective of social power, it is perfectly possible to deny a language the status of an original. Today is 21st February. It is the anniversary of a major event where the right to an original was claimed in blood in what is now Bangladesh in 1952, Ekushe. Students and bystanders, among them a child, were killed and injured by police as they claimed the right to their language. This was not just a claim to an original, but a claim to constitutionality itself to be the language of governance, of civil society, and of the juridical legal. As the citizens' desires, wishes, and needs, ideally, are translated into resistance, into, uh, by the state, into policy, read, read it again. As the citizens, it happens so little that I couldn't even read the sentence. 
as the citizens' desires, wishes, and needs are translated by the state into policy and themselves into resistance if necessary, it must be in the meaning articulation of Bangla, said the student activists of 1948 to 52. Urdu and Bengali were both established as state languages for what was then East Pakistan on the 21st of February 1956, and this was indeed related to the subsequent movement of establishing an independent nation state, also with considerable bloodshed and war rape in the name of the language. Okay, I want to see Dhaka 10. Sumitra. Sumitra, first slide. My mother worked for what is now called the Biranganas, the war raped women. So in 1973, I went sort of behind her and we took some photographs, which are, of course, archivally very important because there are no private photographs of the war raped woman in existence right now. In fact, the Liberation Museum wants these. And I'm just going to show you one of them. This was not a woman, but a child who had been so badly raped that, and by so many people that she neither spoke nor perhaps heard anything nor wanted anything, looked at anything. This was my first mute subaltern. But she was so silent that uh, there was no way that I could write about her at all. And I just wanted to make, put her there because this has not ended. The idea that war rape is a trophy act is, has not ended and it's all the world over and it is under her sign. She, she who was completely unable to translate herself into the world because of this. It is under, and I was not able to write about her at all. The, or think about her even. And the, it is, it's, uh, Naomi Kamukherjee saw these photographs and said, my God, Gaitidi, and that's when they emerged. They were just there. So it is under her sign that I want to make my few remarks about what is it to translate. Shruti, I think you want to take it off the, off the thing, just have a black screen. Today, speaking about translation, let us all remember 21st of February 1952, when the claim to an original, altogether related to the possibility of authoritative and definitive translations, also claimed the blood of the claimants. I want to move now to a situation where the claim to public space, conceptual space, if you like, in the field of power is staged in a different way. It reflects the difference between colonialism and globalization. Not in the nation state, but in the fringes of history, Gramsci's phrase for the subaltern, small social groups in the fringes of history, not class. Not in the nation state, but in the fringes of history, namely among the very bottom layer of societies, where today a particularly insidious kind of exploitation called, quote, development, whose synonyms not translations, and mark the difference, because generally speaking, transla quick translators are synonym hunters, not whose synonyms, not translations, please mark the difference, are vikash or unnayan. This insidious kind of exploitation called development is practiced. Often this is called sustainable development, but in fact, some of us call this sustainable underdevelopment because what is sustained is cost efficiency and profit maximization in the face of the minimum of environmental plausibility that can be maintained. Therefore, sustainable underdevelopment. When I asked what development meant for him, a student from a small new rural university in Nigeria, Kwara State, where I have been working now for some time, said, Improvements in the standard of living, how to measure how a person can afford two square meals a day, have access to clean and potable water, 
and sent kids to schools. This was what he said. Health, in other words, education and welfare. In order, supposedly, to secure this, I myself have suggested elsewhere that, quote, development is an insertion into the circuit of capital without developing the subject of development, the capital I, of capital's ethical or even appropriate social use. Incidentally, since we were talking about feminism, one of the insults to feminism in this area by the, the, the government are those things called swanimvardals. I can't discuss them right now because obviously my topic is elsewhere. But the development of the subject is apparently in the self-interest of the, quote, underdeveloped. But the larger pattern is in the interest of developed capital. Now, think of development all over the world and remember that development workers do not speak the local versions of language spoken by those who are being developed. The policy makers for development consider languages a problem. So while we wag our tails about translation, how important and what are we doing, this is the largest uh, sector of globalization considers languages a problem, considers languages a problem, especially in Africa. Many first languages in Africa were not systematized by the missionaries. These are in use today, although the UN thinks and most benevolent top-down researchers think that they're in small communities and they should be preserved. They are in use. By underclass communities, sure, but also by highly educated folks because of the appeal of the mother tongue. It's like me speaking East Bengali dialect. There's an appeal because that's where I'm from. Because of the appeal of the mother tongue and by electoral candidates who campaign in these languages and maybe provoke ethnic violence, typically before elections. These are survival languages. There is tremendous dialectal continuity between them. And when there is not, there is an enviable level of multilingualism among adjacent subaltern communities. The claim to an original is completely turned around if you consider the history of African languages. These communities write on the memory, because these are unwritten languages. They write on the memory. And you can say, only half fancifully, they practice a pre-scientific digitization. In other words, the lessons of 19th and 20th century linguistics, colonial disciplines, stabilizing the language by giving it a name, putting it in a box, separating it from other languages, grammatizing, establishing orthography, vocabulary and script, among other things, maybe is establish, establishing a historical moment. They become symptomatic when confronted with these languages. These lessons depend on a limited concept of writing, the, the systematization from before, whereas writing on memory, as these unsystematized, unwritten first languages do, creates a stream that today's digitization has exponentially enhanced. One can go on directly without worrying about the old-fashioned notions of how you systematize a language so that they look like ours rather than that incredible wealth of languages that flow into one another. I'm talking about sub-Saharan Bantu languages. Understandably then, a certain vanguard of the discipline of linguistics is now investigating. Now don't mind that I'm talking about Africa. I'm quite often told in India, and it's a shame. Why don't you talk about India? Because there are other things to know. A certain vanguard of the discipline of linguistics is now investigating the ways in which these unwritten and unsystematized languages were taught or absorbed in the context of prevailing multilingualism, not through literacy. It should be mentioned that we are not speaking of languages that are going extinct because of the ecology of languages, and that many institutions are seeking to document and reserve. These attempts are altogether admirable, but they're not identical with the work that I'm describing. Now, suppose we acknowledge that the business of sustainable underdevelopment is today 
the greatest barrier to the creation of that false promise, a level playing field. Much of the failure of this process, even when well-intentioned, is due to the lack of the sort of responsibility enhanced by the teaching of literature as the cultivation of an imagination that can flex into another's space. Now, literature here is not something that is recognizable by us in an elite university and within an English department as literature. It is the literary, and if I had the time, I could tell you how it is possible with West Bengali subalterns, those schools about which you now know, the western border of Birhum, very far away from Shanti Niketan, the, um, in those schools, how it is possible to teach the decimal system in this literary way as flexing your, your imagination toward the other. The, the, the enhanced by the teaching of the literary as the cultivation of an, of an imagination that can flex into another space in order to translate the most intimate act of reading. There's a problem. It is not possible for the development lobby today to attend upon those who are to be developed, inserted into the circuit cap of capital without adequate subject formation, so that their desires can be rearranged into wanting the possibility of development in mind and body, regulated by themselves. We assume, however, that among development workers, there are some who really do wish to touch the ones who are being developed. Let us remind ourselves that the humanities are worldly, not global. The humanities cannot be global. Okay. Let us also remind ourselves that this distinction obliges the humanities to work through collectivities, not only through global networks, even as we also remember that this is a taxonomy, not an opposition. We further remind ourselves that we draw a response from the other, act responsibility through language. And finally, on this list of self-reminders, let us remind ourselves that the subaltern on the fringes of history, located in language, is not generalizable. Although this is not usually the case, even within all of these constraints, we do indeed find some sincere people among health workers and agricultural workers. Education and welfare, let's leave those aside. Typically, job descriptions for development workers do not include language requirements. And also typically, the best intentioned development workers may learn a well-established lingua franca, such as Kiswahili or Isi Zulu, and feel that they are preparing themselves unaware that to those who customarily use the unsystematized first languages, these lingua francas are themselves also languages of power. Some of us are trying to push for the establishment of a language requirement into the development job descriptions. This is an extremely hard effort. I just wrote to the vice chancellor of the Squire State University last night, he responded this morning, that our project has changed slightly, but this is very difficult. Believe me, much more difficult than just translating. Some of us are trying to push for the establishment of a language requirement into the development job descriptions and for the creation of simple on-the-field techniques for those few well-meaning development workers to learn the unsystematized first languages of those who are being developed, and thus to put digitalization into the service of the continuous and persistent destruction of subalternity, the subalternity must be destroyed into citizenship, and pass agency to the subaltern, because it is the subaltern, female or male, who teaches the language to the worker. And there's a complete difference here. I'm speaking then of agency for the condition of possibility of translation, the right to claim an original. My first example, Bangladesh, was from the play of colonialism and sub-colonialism in the aftermath of post-coloniality. My second example comes from contemporary globality, where the narratives of post-coloniality persist, 
but are not the dominant. Here, the claim to constitutionality is so undone by pre-colonial structures of corruption and domination, combined with the absolute technological superiority of the digital, that our own resistant motives just would not suffice. The digital system is not as small like we. Having spoken of establishing the possibility of translation by constitutionally validating the, quote, original, let us think specifically of the situation of translation. Translation's first contribution is to kill the phonic and phonetic existence of the text, the sound body of the text. You have to kill it in order to translate. We walk under the shadow of that loss, whether we are thinking of poetry, of development, or whatever. In the field of constitutionality and global governance, our real problem is elite synonym hunting, incomprehensible to those who are being developed. I have written at great length about the useless elite translations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, incomprehensible to the subaltern. Rather must we understand how we lexicalize the old imperial languages. Sorry, I've got to do it in Bengali because the lexicalization, and some of you will recognize the English words, I'll read slow. Lexicalization, that is to say the creolized English words put into the grammatical structure of my language. That's what we really ought to attend to rather than these elite translations of these documents. Ishkule jabar pote. Now, ishkul, you know what that is, a school. And this is how I speak to my sister. We are, I'm not talking about mocking like some university or, uh, you know, like uh, uh, imitating. Ishkule jabar pote, postapishir pasir dukan, postapish, post office. Postapishir pasir dukan teke, duto pencil kinlam. Pencil, you know, but this is a regular Bengali sentence. Let, I mean, not a subaltern or anything. It took, this is creolity. Some of us have given the name of creolization to the movement of history itself. It took a Buddha to choose creole so he could talk to the people, a political gesture that was destroyed almost immediately after his death. It took a Marcel Proust to write what is French but false Latin because he wanted to stand to defend the accent of Françoise, a maidservant. But it is the situation within poetry that makes most tragic the deaths of the phonic body upon which translation exists. Here is the opening of a very famous poem. The great poet Shankar Ghosh and I are putting out together, I want the second thing, it's the Plato page, putting out together of a critical edition of Bengali texts on the model of the low classical library of European antiquity that has lasted 150 years. A regularly elite project, right? This is our model. Uh, this, I'm sorry, Harish, it's my personal copy of Book Age of the Republic, Democracy. That's why it's got notes. Anyway, so the Bengali on the left and the English on the right and all kinds of uh, footnotes, you know this, and critical introduction, etc. This is our model. So, now listen to the listen to how the language is killed, the sound is killed. Our first one is Mayna Bhagapu. Shambhu Koshamore Pori, Bir Churamuni, Bir Bahu, Choli Jave Gala Jampure Akale. Kaho Hede Bi Amrita Vashini, Kun Bira Bare Bari, Shana Putipade, Pathai Larani Puna, Rokha Kulonidi, Ragavari. This is the first line. Now here is the extraordinary translation by Clinton Seely. Euro-American, who has loved Bengali well enough to be able to tackle this difficult task, and in spite of the magnificence of his literalist translation, echoing or attempting to echo as much as possible the grandeur of the Bengalis, especially the fantastic proper names, you will hear the corpse of the original sending out its ghost in the translation. You just heard me read it, uh, say it. Here's wonderful, but not the same, it's on the death of the phonic. When in face-to-face -face combat, Virabahu, he has to write the Sanskrit words, we say Birabahu. When in face-to-face -face combat, Virabahu, crowned gem of warriors, fell and went before his time, Okale, 
to Yama's city, speak, O goddess of ambrosial speech, Kahohe Devi Amrita Vashini. Which best of warriors did the foe of Raghava, Raghavadi, treasure trove among that clan of Rakshasas, designate commander, then send fresh to the battle? Lovely translation, genuinely good, but nonetheless, this is why the translator must enter the spirit of the original, prepared to write much better than conceptual learned before reason begins. I'm a teacher and student and of comparative literature, and I want to cite here from something that some of you might have read, the Rethinking Comparativism. I'm standing with my mother in Chagall Airport in Paris. For a week, we have fed our ears on academic French. Suddenly, I hear an exchange in the harsh accents of upstate New York, some, a cup of coffee or something. I turn to my mother and say, in Bengali, roughly this, hard to listen to this stuff. Ma, kane to lagana. Hard to listen to this stuff. And my mother, dear, mother tongue, baba, matri vrashatu. Dear, mother tongue. My mother, caught up as she was in the heyday of resistance against the Raj, still extended imaginative charity to English. I've told this story before and will say it again. Today, I hold on to the fact that there is a language, and Harish, I'm quoting from that text that you recommended, because I come back to it all the time. There is a language we learn first, mixed with the pre-phenomenal, which stamps pre-phenomenal before we enter into phenomenality, which stamps the meta-psychological circuits larger than our psychology, circuits of lingual memory, think computer. The child invents a language, beginning by bestowing signification upon a part object, breast, bottle, and so on. The parents, quote, learn this language. Because they speak a named language, the child's language gets inserted into the named language with a history before the child's birth, which will continue after its death. As the child begins to navigate this language, he or she is beginning to access the entire interior network of that historical language, all its possibility of articulations, for which the best metaphor that can be found is, especially in the age of computers, memory, underived memory, without actually a past, personal past, upon which to, to go. By comparison, cultural memory is a crude concept of narrative rememorization that attempts to privatize the historical record. Comparative literature imagines that each language may be activated in this special way and makes at the way we learn it at our mother's, uh, in our mother's lap and makes an effort to produce a simulacrum through the reflexivity of language as habit. One could go to Marx's definition 18 Brumaire, you all know it, too little time. Here we translate not the content but the very moves of languaging, we can provisionally call this peculiar form of translation before translation, the comparison in comparative literature. This is not to make an opposition between the natural spontaneity of the emergence of my language place and the artificial effortfulness of learning foreign languages. Rather, it is to emphasize the metapsychological outside just of my psychology and telecommunicative nature of the subjects being encountered by the languaging of place. If we, because native languages exist before, and we want to do this with so-called foreign languages, if we entertain the spontaneous artificial opposition, we will possibly value our own place. There's only one mother tongue, it's like mine, and nobody can translate anything from it. That's a mistake. We will possibly value our own place over all others, and thus defeat the ethical comparativist impulse, a sense of equivalence among languages, rather than a comparison of historical civilizational content. Etienne Baliba has suggested that equivalence, if you think of equivalence in this way, it blurs differences, whereas equality requires them, precisely because civil